The first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge the wisdom in this room. In particular, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land on which we meet, um, and I mean that in a very heartfelt and fundamental way. Um, I pay my respects to the, to, to the traditional custodians, past and present, and those here in this room. Secondly, I just acknowledge the fact that you're all here. Thanks for coming. And I hope today that we get some really good things coming out of the workshop section, uh, session of, uh, of, of, of our time together. But before we do this, there's talk of cancer, there's talk of this, there's talk of you know, all sorts of different things there that could be a little bit down. And I'm determined that we actually have a platform that is in some way uplifting and inspiring. And to do this, I think we've got to have a bit of fun and I think we've also got to do something that's a little bit participatory, if you like. Is that okay with you? You don't feel threatened by that? Because what I'd like you to do, I'll show you what I'd like you to do in just a little while. I've got this, I've got this slight mobility problem on the left, but I can still dance. So don't you worry about that. So, but the go is, we can feel a little bit down. Now, what's a song we'd all know when we feel a little bit down? I'm going to suggest one because I thought you might be slow at that. <laughs> the, the song is, and I'd like you to repeat this after me. It's the Vulgar Boatman. Oh, he ho. Oh, he ho. That's beautiful. <laughs> hey, you guys could tour. Now, all I need you to do is actually, in a minute, I'm, I'm going to ask you to stand up and meet somebody new, and actually together, we're just going to sing and introduce ourselves together. All right? Here we go. Okay, one, two, three, stand, meet somebody new. Okay, are we ready? Now you're going to sing it together. One, two, three. Oh, he, oh, 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 he, oh, 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 he, oh. Now for the second bit while I've got you standing. We need to, there's a song that you've probably heard me sing a little bit in workshops and things, and it goes something like, He now, he You better listen to me, every one of you. There's some things I want to share with you. This is a sharing space today. Yeah, a sharing space today. So let's get proceedings underway. <laughs> let's go. What I, what I wanted to, to dwell upon a little bit were actually essentially some of the things that, that Bill has talked about. I think, um, yeah, oh, Anne, Anne has said that it's all right for me not to work so hard. Um, now, these days. No, she didn't. She told me just to do what I like that made, made life fun. So I thought that this could be fun and we would do that. Is that right? Did I get that right? Did I get that right? <laughs> Nearly right. And um, <laughs> so uh, you see that, it, you see that in, in my, I'm going to talk a little bit about a career and how if you're a younger person, how don't forsake family for career. You know, that big error. All right, get those things right. I'm actually going to give some advice. That's a shocker. <laughs> All right, I'm going to... Um, also, I should acknowledge my family that's here. I mean, just look, you know, brother, sister, sisters overseas, one sister sick, nieces, nephews. Um, oh, and my mum. My mum, she's here. Um, and she's a, a teacher from way back. Um, so... It's really good to have people here today. And of course, people have travelled from so far. Um, I see people from interstate. I see people, well, Bill from, the, from, from Maryland. And I'm just so grateful that you could be here today. Um, so I want to talk about teaching, more about that idea of having fun, more, more about the idea of critical social science, if you like, in terms of enlightenment, empowerment and emancipation. And I want to nestle that in some of the old stuff about Aristotle and Socrates and what it's old is new again and say that some of the students coming to our courses are actually coming to our courses because they're different. 
because they don't just give them more of the technology, they don't just give them more of the science, they give them more of a thing called phronesis. They give them more of a thing called praxis. But we call it problem-based learning and we call it immersive education and we call it different things. But it's actually old stuff and that's what we're doing. And we're going to nestle some of those wicked problems that actually confront us, like um, oh, the fact that 2.3 billion people in the world don't have the dignity or, or the health benefits of a toilet. Still, after so many years. We get, that's, that's, that's wicked. How could that be? How could something that's so simple not be able to be solved? What makes that complex? What makes it have you know, emergent complexity, new and unexpected things pop out and make it hard to solve? So we're going to look at these wicked problems and define them. And I'm going to split them into two things, ones that can kill you and ones that can't. And I'm going to concentrate on the ones that can kill you. And we're going to do a little, we're going to do a little workshop on one of these, and I hope that you can help me about it, because, help me with it, because I'm doing a little bit of uh, advocacy work on lung cancer. And I figured if I get 100 smart people in a room, you might be able just to just workshop something for 10 minutes and give me some really bright ideas. Now, we only want the best ideas, OK? We right with it, so that'll be easy, and that will happen as part of the workshop seamlessly. Now we're going to then chart a positive way forward because what I'd like to come out of this workshop is that we understand more about the things that I've mentioned above, and we also have got some practical outcomes in terms of the workshop. Does it sound like a fun afternoon? Please say yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. I better learn how to change that. I'd like to make some acknowledgements, and I've left off there the Lung Foundation, and I'm, I'm sorry about that to them, but first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the International Water Centre. What a great place to work, what a great group of people, what a great team. Um, the support of the School of Chemical Engineering at the University of Queensland has been, has been um, wonderful, and it's been a wonderful place to be able to, to liaise with uh, Professor Paul Lant for, uh, the, to, for, I suppose, for our course to have a, a, a place to live. And, um, a place that we could call home, actually in a huge institutional bureaucracy, nestled in four other bureaucracies, of, not just University of Queensland, but Griffith, but Monash, um, and University of Western Australia. Um, also, there's, there's a friend of mine here today, Michael Berry from the Hinterland Times, who actually told me at one stage about 18 months ago, if you wanted to talk about and share your story, Peter, there's a story you can share. So I acknowledge Michael here today as well. Family, I said it was important. Look at that. There's mum and dad. Mum, you don't look a day older. No, but isn't it good um, to look back and see um, that uh, you know, you've still got these, these photos and these memories of parents and the guidance that you've received from them. Oh, and good looking girls. <laughs> I just can't get over it sometimes. Um, you know, you finish up with a, with a family unit and it's, it really is one of the most precious things if you can get one of a group of friends like this family like this, they're just so important. And look, the extended family, and you can see many of them there today. That dress will come back in fashion, I suppose. <laughs> um, no, and, and, and love the dress, and we actually moved it with great care this morning when we were shifting things around, didn't we? It was good. So you can see that um, I come as part of a bit of a package, and there's the package as we get a bit greyer and change a bit and move around um, at a Lung Foundation barbecue recently. Uh, and there's the package, you feed them, and they grow. <laughs> so uh, there are three children. They didn't get a recent photo, guys, so you don't have to worry too much. And there you go, there's the famous tattoo. Um, what I'm trying to say is that in, in life, keep, the, keep things at the forefront that are really important to you, and, and don't get tricked with work. Please don't get tricked with work, because at the end, um, the people that, that will matter most to you, maybe your work colleagues, but really try and keep that work-life balance right. Um, Doug the Dugong was something that uh, I came up with as, well, he was charismatic megafauna, I suppose. Flipper gets all the cred, doesn't he? Don't you think? You see those things that everyone knows, the king of the sea, every society, the king of the sea. Well, that's not very good. Flipper's there, he's good looking, but that's about it. You know, the Dugong are actually direct monitors of, of the health of seagrass. More, more dugong alive and healthy, we got, we got more seagrass. We're healthy on the land. It's, you know, land, sea interconnections. And that's what it's all about. So I've, I've spent a bit of time with Doug the dugong and doing things with Doug. And you can see here, this is the fighting dugong. When he was handing, when I thought, well, he can handle dirty old 
you know, runoff from land. Maybe you can handle, di handle dirty old cancer. It only took me two years to get permission from Mum to get a tattoo. <laughs> so, was that right, Mum? Was it a bit longer than that? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. But it started, I tried to find one in 1982 um, when I first started out at Surratt, but I couldn't. So there I was as a science teacher. This just gives you a quick idea of where I've come from. You can see that the children were much smaller then. <laughs> and um, Mullaney High School, 1991, you can see me edging my way up the promotional trail, um, sitting, craving um, promotion next to the principal there as acting assistant principal. I realised that um, my work in environmental education wasn't really going to sit very well um, in a conventional high school, but I did my best. Um, having come from an outdoor education centre, where I met that good-looking girl before, yeah, uh, that took us to here, and uh, yeah, that was the journey, and that was a, that was a real education, actually, um, working in, in schools with students. And the Mullaney State High School community is a great one, and I was very privileged to work there. It rains there, so I managed to keep my connections with land and sea, the land and sea interface, something since I've been a little kid. I really, really wanted a job that didn't even really exist there. I saw Jacques Cousteau and I saw people doing all sorts of things with, with land and water and runoff and, and, and healthy waterways and things, but there were no jobs like that in the late 70s. There were no jobs like that in the early 80s. And so we had to sort of create jobs. And in the meantime, you just keep in touch with what you're doing. You can see my mate Brian and I there. There's just a flooded Mary River. We're going quite well. We're going downstream. And you can see how Brian is at the front, and he's actually leaning over really deeply so that he has a pressure wave underneath the boat, and he won't tip over. But you can see the fat slug in the back <laughs> is not particularly athletic or, or flexible, so the pressure wave is actually on top of the boat. And you see the boat tips over. Um, Often that's a lesson for me in life. I've had to learn many physical things by doing them over and over and over again. Um, but never mind, just don't give up, be persistent. You can use boats for other things. This is when we um, went on a, a trip down um, Mellon Creek, actually, with uh, Dr John Shuttleworth and with a group of uh, gifted and talented students. And, and we looked at uh, Landsborough as a source of pollution, a, a town as a point source of pollution. But using the platforms of uh, whenever, whenever I could, a teacher training things, training up other students. So not only just using the skills, but then also using um, water education and, and things that they'd learnt, uh, we'd learnt through um, Professor Bill Statt from the University of Michigan and the Global Rivers Environmental Education Network became integral to uh, the work that I did in the Mary River and in other places. And you can see there I'm looking a little thinner, aren't I? Um, I've enjoyed doing 100 kilometre canoe races and things like that. So there's all those, those sorts of things in my background. Um, and music started to play a part. I don't know if Captain Catchman is here today or Woody is a weed or Hugo the turtle or Wizzy the water drop, but um, I don't think I've been in all those costumes. Um, but yeah, I'm in the middle, obviously, and we'll hear a little bit more of that. But for me, the path to a person and environmental change is really linked with the heart, the head and the hands and we've got to actually work out what the connections are. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. But for me, music has been part of it. So in a master's program, it's meant getting in the water. It's meant being outside. You can see Lien there working with Dr. Fran Sheldon, and uh, she's in Echidna Creek in the Maruchi River. You can see, you can see uh, Tim and I recently, when we went to um, give a prize for the, uh, health, um, for the Dugong Rock competition, which we'll, we'll do in a little while. You can see the sorts of things that we've been starting to do with our PhD student, Anthony Kung, um, on the banks of the Maduwara. That's with Dr. Anne Polina, a Nikina woman, um, on the Fitzroy. And we're looking at um, a, a, a PhD that actually follows on, um, well, not even follows on, but is, but is, is constructed around some of the, the knowledge bases and these ideas of uh, transcultural um, knowledge tra um, of knowledge transfer in a transcultural sense. Um, and Anthony, if you want to talk to him, we'll explain all that to you later on. There he is in the back there. Um, and, you know, so getting out and about, even while I've had cancer, I've, I've gone and done some of these sorts of field trips and uh, start to establish those links between the west and the east coast of Australia. 
um, so we can get some of these sorts of things happening. In my work, I've done everything from you know, working with students, small mammal trapping, there's a bandicoot there, all the time thinking about how can I get the students doing this. This is working at an outdoor education centre. Um, you know, sailing was another platform to actually use, and you can, you can see Anne there actually just with her eyes closed, singing away. We, we, we actually did a little bit of work at the outdoor education centre using, using boats, using um, a 53 foot catch as a, as a platform. And when I was lucky enough to work at the International Water Centre, that's our first group of students from our first year. And you can see that we've grown considerably from the, um, uh, well, I won't try and even count them there, but you know, around eight students I think we had to, and I'll acknowledge Dr. Brian McIntosh at this stage and say we've got a few more now, haven't we? Yeah, things are going all right. There's also been hard work as part of this having fun. <laughs> in, in terms of uh, having to learn about Hanoi Vodka, um, in, um, oh, I've got two of those. Mr. Tawen's beating me. Um, there's, been, there's been friends that I've made throughout the way in, in, in networked organisations. The Network of Asian River Basin Organisations, in fact, uh, was one, one um, eight-day um, workshop that we, we ran um, on several occasions, actually, for the Japanese government. Yeah, in Indonesia, done some work there. Actually, as well, all sorts of different places. Well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to really give a travel log here. What I'm, what I'm trying to show is that by, by following your heart and having fun and being stubborn and being persistent and trying hard, you can get to do some cool things. And that's what, that's what it's all about. And, um, and, and be with your family. You know. But find your thing, I think, and back yourself. They're two important things, very important things for me. Now, I said in this talk we were going to talk about... Um, wicked problems, and we're going to talk about um, communicating those sorts of wicked problems. Problems are at the intersection of values and at the intersection of knowledge. And Aristotle and Socrates had something to say about these things, and I'd just like to cut to that now. Aristotle, Aristotle, does anyone know the song? Okay. That's, that's Aristotle's basic knowledge system. People familiar with it? You'd be familiar with it, wouldn't you? A lot of people here have had professional training. You're all involved in science. You'd know what goes on with, with things like this. There's a basic sort of knowledge system that everyone would know, maybe not. Okay. Modern science emphasises these. If, if you care to read a book that Dr. Roger Shaw was, Roger? <laughs> Roger's a man who actually had a profound influence on my life. Roger? Um, Voltaire's Bastards. John Ralston Saw. You know, the critique of instrumental reason in the West, all that sort of thing. Um, went through and said that we're too much in, 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 in the modern day in terms of thinking about um, systems of knowledge, you know, chemistry, biology, physics, blah, 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 on and on, and applying that knowledge in various ways. And that what that leads us is a situation where we have actually a dual-edged sword in our hands. And that dual-edged sword can lead to discoveries like... Um, the, the drug that's keeping me alive at the moment for the cancer that I'm suffering. Okay, so that can be, that can be a good thing. Um, but equally, uh, there could be some, some bad things that happen uh, as a result of that drug. If it finds its way into sewage systems or whatever, it could cause problems actually with water treatment and so on. Um, so things never come uh, neutral. Things always come with some sort of some sort of cost, maybe some sort of trade-off. But uh, knowledge in its pure sense, Ralston Saul says, you know, you can, is, you know, we get it down, we make it very reductionist, good stuff, that, that works. Um, we can find out about things. But then when we go to apply them, we don't usually apply them in a laboratory. We don't usually apply them in a place where we've just got one parameter that we can vary. We apply them in places where we've got several things that are happening, lots of different things that are happening. In fact, chaotic things that are happening. And we call those sorts of places, well, wicked problems, if you like. Um, and that's where I think we need to be concentrating more. There's a, there's a planner, I can never think of his name, probably I'll say it, probably Bent Fiverberg, a, a Dane, who actually um, emphasises that for professionals, for people, anyone doing anything, really, in, uh, in training, usually more than training in education, we're not really looking... Um, 
people, well, I'll put it this way, when people come into our programs, what I've seen is that they've been involved in um, their professional lives for some, say, five to ten years. They realise that there are difficulties um, in the work that they're doing because they felt that they were going to go off and solve this real world problem with water in a slum or with sanitation on an island or with um, catchment management on the Great Barrier Reef. But what they find themselves doing is, 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 is herding data into more amenable data sets that people can understand, looking at numbers, looking at trying to make their science more accessible and understanding, as if moving their hands and, and speaking more clearly will actually get them better understood. And um, what we find is that there's a, a call that's been around in the literature now for some well, 10 to 15 to more years to say, no, we need to go past understanding. We need, we need to go and meet people where they are and understand, get their perspective, if they don't really trust our science, if they don't value our science, if they don't value what's happening when we talk about wicked problems and natural resource management and the Great Barrier Reef and managing it, or the pluses and the minuses of using various drugs or whatever it is, then our science has got to become more socially robust. And to do that, we have to know when, we have to be right at that interface of where values are articulating and impacting on the facts and whether the, whether facts really are facts, actually, whether sometimes we might have clouded and selectively ironed out what we'll take and what we won't take. And I'll give you some examples of that in just a while in relation to lung cancer advertising. But we've gone very much into the, the techni and the, the, the episteme, they say, um, or well, I say, and that we need to think more in this phrenesis, the intersection of values and, under, and, uh, and values and knowledge. Now, it's a prudent understanding of what should be done in a practical situation. Doesn't seem hard, does it? Practical thoughtful doing is what it should lead to. But that's, that's the thing, because I've looked at, say, and I'll go use the Barrier Reef again, I've looked at 200 years of systematic data gathering. I've looked at 200 years of um, people putting lots of data into different sort of formats and then saying we should do this, we should do that. But if you look at it really, the slow and inexorable decline of the Barrier Reef still continue. And as a person who's sat on the Outlook reference group for the federal government looking at recommendations, um, and, and, and outputs of what's happening in the five yearly outlook report for the reef. You know, there, there's real challenges ahead there unless we can get things in a, in a way that they're more frenetic. Okay, so that's why it's important to think about these wicked problems, not just as gathering more data, making it more communicative to people, but meeting people where they are and their information and, and, in and their science has to be more socially robust. To do that as well, when we work with our students, we get to the point where we say, you've got to know something about yourself because you've got to decide what your values are. So, you know, Pe Socrates doesn't get a big... <laughs> he's often not reported. You know, people report that Socrates said the question or, or it's made the statement, know thyself. So we've just got to not know people's values when we start to work with these wicked problems and understand how our science articulates with them and what they value and they think is important. We also have to know ourselves which can be a bit of a struggle. And this, if you have a look at it, is something that we get people to fly, or I'm hoping to get people to fly. I've only just started working on this in the last 18 months. Can you read that at all? Yeah, you can read it. You can, say, you can see when people sometimes come into our course, they've got a variety. The Master of Integrated Water Management at University of Queensland, now opening at University of Western Australia. Just click on the website, you can get there. It's a good degree. It's a good degree. Um, am I selling it a bit? Okay. Okay, if you, if you look around here, you'll, you'll see on this, I've tried to align this to the various disciplines that might come into our course. About 40 to 50 percent of people might be um, engineers and interested in things or, or stuff, chemists, scientists. And so they'd be over on the right-hand side. And actually, they look at the water management world through a, through a sort of a, the, the, the right-hand side. But look, what else is going along? If we want to get down to Better Bay, if that's where, that's where we're getting, we need to actually fly the whole thing and see that um, there are some people who are interested in um, individuals and empowerment and equality and ethics and empathy. We might call them, oh, sociologists. And there are some people who are interested in knowledge sharing. Um, they're there as well. And we, we look over and we see that there are people who are interested in law and have great skills in these areas and interested in participation. There are also planners and people who use market-based in, instruments and people who are interested in doing now, 
All of those things together could make up a really good integrated water management team that could tackle some of these wicked complex problems that sit in that area of phonesis, that sit right at that intersection between values and knowledge. But very often what we do is we just think, well, I know what needs to be done. It's because they don't understand the communication, right? So I'm going to go and um, uh, give them some, some better pamphlets or I'm going to write a report in a certain way or do something and that'll work. Now, what we try and do is say, you've got to really um, be, be thinking about a whole approach and what your whole thing demands because these wicked problems really are messy problems. They're not necessarily evil. Sometimes they could be based um, on, a, on, a, on actions that are, that are evil, but usually they're, they're, they're people trying to make um, for a better world. Like students, like Alita Ragonjo, who came to us, you know, 15 years working in, um, in, in the uh, slums of Kenya, of, N of Nairobi, obviously looking for a way to do things better and that actually just knowing how to run the pipes and do things wasn't working that he needed to get to where people were at and their values. He needed to be able to hook into the social capital that was there. So we can sit in a place where we don't need to just know things. We need to know what we really value and how those things we value will impact on what we do to make the world a better place. So it's, it's not just even knowing them, it's knowing ourselves. Then we really can take place, we really can take action to make the world a better place. Now Aristotle, as I said, he wasn't... He, he didn't know the words wicked problems, but I'd say he'd probably put them in that area of phrenesis, a prudent understanding of what should be done in a practical situation, and say that we should be engaging in praxis, practical thoughtful doing. Now I'd say that I'm going to posit to you that wicked problems exist, exist generally in two types. Those that usually do not result in the loss of human life, although it can be pretty close and pretty touch and go sometimes, like um, trying to so sort out the Murray-Darling River Basin plan for water allocation. Um, people can feel a bit threatened there. But seriously, sometimes in Australia we found with our 2008 students, we took them out to uh, experience uh, wicked problems and what people were actually doing about them in the land care movement. And we went to Monto to the 2008 conference there. And when you look at land and water management there, they actually had uh, workshops on suicide prevention. They actually had workshops where people were, um, people, men particularly, were, were, were getting depressed and were suiciding because land and water management problems actually hadn't been that well managed at all and they were in desperate straits. So, um, so, so mental health first aid was very much at the fore there. But generally, let's just, let's just do it this way, that do usually result in the in loss of human life. Um, and those were the ones that where the golden rule comes into play, where the Millennium Development Goals, I'll just use an example, the Millennium Development Goals not being achieved. Um, so they sit uncomfortably where, you know, surely after, what, sure, sure, surely after, you know, 10 years in a world we can, we can work out why, why so many individuals, you know, under the age of five are, are dying of, of, of diarrhoea and we can do something about it. Particularly in Australia where uh, infant mortality rates for Australian Aborigines uh, are, 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 through diarrhoea are, are much higher. Surely we could do something about these problems, but they sit and they and they grain, um, they graze um, on, on on my mind and, and actually make me think um, how how can we actually get to this point where we're articulating the values with, with 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 what we what we want to happen because I'm sure if we put the right resources out we can solve it overnight. Sometimes we solve wicked problems by trading off human life for things, and the following problems I'm. I'm going to present work exactly on that stuff, trading off people for things and people for people. The Middle East, a wicked problem. 5,000 years ago, Leptis Magna, look at that. They had that all worked out, an old Roman city sitting on the shores of the Mediterranean. They had sewage, they had water supply, they had everything going. Life wasn't too crash hot if you were a slave, but it was okay. And they've excavated now about one third of that, the Libyans, and it was a it was a, a beautiful place to live. Um, but then we cut to today. Does it look a bit familiar? That's part of the great man-made river, where um, Colonel Gaddafi was actually draining 
um, the, the, the great uh, an Artesian Basin um, in the middle of Libya, um, four metre diameter pipes, uh, 1,200 kilometres long, and, and actually moving water great distances, 1,200 kilometres as I said long, um, un unbelievable um, feats in engineering uh, to get water for agriculture from Libya. And you look at it, it still hasn't solved the problem. Even if you look at Libya itself, you find that any of the creeks that are running into the sea that are lucky enough to be there are a mess. You find the ocean outfalls running directly into the sea. You find that the Daewoo Corporation and people, jets and bombardments notwithstanding, this was two years ago, have actually you know, been building away like crazy there. And um, they're going to find the water from somewhere for coastal development, for all sorts of development. And these are the sorts of wicked problems in which um, uh, uh, we, we engage where we're doing, we were helping doing some, some planning with the Libyan government just as a, a, a test activity, I suppose, um, with some of their, their planners and scientists. And it was, it was interesting to see the, the way that they approached their problems and where their values actually emanated from because while the repairs were somewhat ancient, uh, the values allocated um, to, to what they would be doing came from the man on the right, that wasn't me. So I let this magna I finished up sitting one day wondering how, why is it so hard to manage water so sustainably at the public bathhouse, a nice spot but a little public now. Or pick another, any other large urban problem in any part of the world and you'll find wicked problems that direct, impact directly on the loss of human life. Would you like to be the planner there in Dakar? The principal plan of working out how to get water supply, how to get effluent taken away, how to find a place for someone to live in, uh, in a situation like that. When some of our students come to it and they come from 23 different countries, they're the sorts of places that they're coming from and working from. And they're not always coming, well, they're not coming just to learn more about this or more about that. They want to learn about wicked problems and, and phrenesis. And as I said, those three things are drawing and we've got to know consciously when we put them together when we put them apart. Because when we actually start doing action planning and we do things in these areas, the things that drive it are the principles and values and very often they're left until the end. They say, we'll come up with a the plan and then we'll put the social scientists in at the end. And that's not really what we want to see. Those principles and values should be core to the actual activity and we should know when we're dealing with facts and we should know when we're dealing with values and we should know when those two things impact on each other. We've got to learn very much to walk in the shoes of other people when we do this work, and that's a very hard thing. I think for people who are mostly from developed countries such as us, it's actually a little bit much for us to, to entertain the ideas of fully um, becoming involved in, uh, in trying to solve these sorts of problems. The people who are there are, have got to be empowered to do this work themselves. So that's why there's that enlightenment, empowerment, emancipation that I think is key to the extent of concern for social science. The walking in the shoes of the other is important. Now, you're going to find out a lot about this, as I said, in Dancing with Dugongs, as Bill said, in Dancing with Dugongs, having fun and developing practical philosophies for environmental education and research. It's coming soon to an iBook shop or a book site near you as soon as we finish writing it this month.